All right, welcome back. Uh, this is Physics 3210 uh, for University of Windsor. Uh, I am Dr. Hammond, and we'll be continuing on talking about special relativity, and in this lecture we'll be talking about transformation and the geometry of relativity. Uh, so in the last lectures I had some XKCD comics that I thought were uh, particularly appropriate. Um, this is, I remembered, uh, there's also this what if article from XKCD uh, where people would ask a question of what would happen if, um, and you know, it would be something uh, kind of an, an insane question, uh, but would have some kind of, you know, physics answer to it. And so this, his very first what if, one, uh, what if question was, what would happen if you tried to hit a baseball pitch to 90% of the speed of light? Uh, and he breaks down all the physics about this, which is actually kind of interesting. Uh, so instead of being able to throw a baseball at only 90 or 80 miles an hour, uh, like somebody with a decent arm, uh, you could somehow launch this thing to be close to the speed of light. Um, and so uh, I, I highly recommend that you check it out because I thought it was kind of interesting. All right, so uh, getting to special relativity, um, Einstein uh, kind of revolutionized uh, the way that we think of uh, mechanics. Uh, with these two postulates of special relativity. The first one is actually a really old postulate, which is the, the principle of relativity, uh, that the laws of physics apply in all inertial systems. So this was actually already formulated by Galileo um, about 300 years before Einstein. So back when Galileo uh, came up with this idea, he said, well, if somebody's on a boat on a perfectly calm day and is just sailing across at a constant velocity, would that person on the boat notice any difference uh, like any physical difference of what's going on versus somebody who's standing on the shoreline. And so if you're, if you're on this boat um, and you, you know, throw a baseball or you drop a baseball or whatever it is, um, you know, you have some pendulum swing, would you notice that you're on the boat rather than standing by the beach? Uh, so we already come up, come up with this idea that uh, inertial um, physics isn't changed in uh, different inertial reference systems. Uh, Newton, of course, used this as well to formulate uh, Newton's laws. Uh, but so this this law, this principle, first principle of relativity, is kind of well known and well established. Uh, but it's his second postulate that uh, the speed of light is universal, no matter what your reference frame is. Is kind of uh, was really surprising, um, and so. Um, it turns out, though, that if you look at Maxwell's equations, you recognize that this is actually required in order for Maxwell's equations to be consistent. Um, this is part of the motivation for the Michelson-Morley experiment that we discussed in the last lecture, um, and that is that um, if you're if you're measuring something uh, in one of these frames, who cares if you're moving the magnet close to a, a loop of wire or moving the wire close to a magnet? Um, that's that's you know basically this um, you know satisfies the first law uh, um, or first postulate of special relativity, um, but it turns out it's actually more it's deeper than that. Um, Maxwell's equation actually requires that um, you have to have this universal speed of light, and I'll be talking about that in uh, the next lecture. All right, uh, so one of the first things we have to throw out um, when we use those postulates then is that things can be simultaneous. Um, in one reference system, in uh, in one inertial frame or in another inertial frame. So on the left, we have this cart that's just kind of sitting there. So we're say standing in this cart, or we're standing on the ground next to this cart. Doesn't matter because this cart is moving. Um, and we have a light bulb that all of a sudden flashes um, some light, and it travels to the right, and it travels to the left. And if we have a little photodiode here and a little photodiode here. We would say that because this distance to the right and the distance to the left is the same, then of course uh, the time that it takes is going to be the exact same amount of time because it's the distance over the speed of light. Um, and so then these two photodetectors light up at the exact same time, and we say, okay, great, this is you know uh, simultaneous. But if we had this car uh, moving to the right, then we, and we all of a sudden at some point had a flash of light, then the one going to the left doesn't have to travel as far because this car has actually moved a bit. Um, and so then because it has to move a bit, um, this distance is less. And so it actually hit the back of the car first, whereas to the right it, has to, it ha actually has to travel a farther distance. And so then um, it would then light up this one second. 
Um, and so that means that if we're in the car, we would see this, where both the front and the back get lit up simultaneously. Whereas if we're not in the car, if we're stationary and this thing's moving by us, uh, we see that this one turns on first and then this one. And so that means that things in different inertial reference frames aren't simultaneous. Um, and we'll be talking a bit more about that later. Okay. Um, so now we'll start to derive some of these uh, Lorentz um, transformations. So the first one is time dilation. Um, and so if you have this cart and it's going to the right um, and um, you have light instead of going to the right and to the left, it goes down. Uh, so if you're in this cart, then of course this thing goes down just directly and it just has to travel at distance h. Um, and so that means the time that it takes to travel in this cart is of course just h divided by c, and that's easy enough. But if you think about it, um, if you're standing on the ground and this thing's moving by you, uh, then in order to actually reach the same part in the cart, um, that this photon actually has to travel down to the right. And so it has to travel a larger distance. So it has to, and so you can see by, um, uh, by Pythagoras theorem that you have, that this has to travel a distance. This is square root of h squared plus uh, v delta t squared. And so that's a farther distance. But we've said that uh, by the Lorentz uh, transformations, that nothing should happen in this vertical direction because this cart is moving to the right um, and this light is traveling down. And so that means that uh, this distance h hasn't changed anything. And so that means that this, the time that it takes for this light to travel from here to here actually must take longer. And so the only way that we can actually satisfy Einstein's postulates is if we find that the time in the cart versus the time that for us standing next to the cart uh, are different. And this leads to time dilation. And where this delta t bar, um, this, this time of the, of the clock moving in the cart, is going to be our time delta t uh, times this square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. Um, and so since this is less than 1, that means that this moving clock, this clock that's in this cart here, will be running slower than our clock. And so running clocks move slow. That's kind of the easy way to remember how time dilation works. So although it's called time dilation, which you'd think like, not like a pupil dilating, it gets bigger. Um, it actually <laughs> seems to be the opposite of that, that, um, that this moving clock actually uh, has uh, decreases in value. Um, and so you just kind of have to uh, think about what that exactly means to understand why it's called time dilation. Um, but the easy mnemonic would be that moving clocks run slow. Okay, uh, so now that we've talked about time dilation, there's also, from the Lorentz transformations, uh, there's a, a, an effect in the x direction or the direction that this thing is moving. Um, and so we'll look at how that affects the length of what we measure these objects to be. And so if you have a cart, again, stationary, and you have a lamp at the back of the cart, and it is shining some light, and it hits off a mirror that's at the front of the cart, and then reflects to the back, you'd say that the time that this takes is going to be twice the distance of this cart, twice the length of this cart divided by c, which is the speed of light, of course. But in a moving cart, um, so if we're standing off to the side and we see this, this cart flying by us, we have this flash of light all of a sudden at this uh, instant in space and time, that this, this ray of light has to travel a farther distance because this light is going um, and this cart has actually moved this distance of v delta t1 and then it hits this mirror and then it comes back and to the back of the cart. But again, this cart has moved an amount v delta t2. So this amount here is the exact same amount here. Um, and so t1 is going to be this length of the cart plus v times delta t1 all divided by c. And delta t2 will be the length of this cart minus uh, v delta t2 because that's how much this has moved in that time divided by c, of course. Uh, so you solve for delta t1 and delta t2, and then our total delta time, instead of being here, delta t bar is 2 times delta x bar over c. We get that delta t is 2 delta x over c, so it's the same uh, kind of fr uh, form that we have here. But then we have uh, this 1 over 1 minus v squared over c squared. Um, but we've already seen this, the square root of this 
uh, with time dilation. And so if we put this into how we also explain delta t's and how the time dilation works, then we can actually get that this delta x bar and this delta x are related to one another by this one over square root uh, of one minus b squared over c squared. So again, uh, we get something that uh, this is going to be less than one. And so since this is divided by something that's less than one, this is going to be bigger. So we have delta x divided or multiplying by something that's greater than one means that delta x bar is greater. Um, again, it kind of is counterintuitive that we say that this is length contraction or Lorentz contraction. Um, and it's easier to think of it that we call it length contraction, that it's the, the length of this object is going to be the original length uh, times the square root of one minus v squared over c squared. And that way, this is less than one. And so the original length where we would have this stationary frame is then moving. And what we measure is that it's shorter. Uh, so just kind of uh, think about that of why we derive these things to look like this. But then actually what we say is this, although this is, <laughs> this is smaller, we call this time dilation. And why this is actually bigger, we call this length contraction. And it's because we're dealing with delta x and delta t and delta t bar and delta x bar are the moving things. So it's, it's written this way in our textbook, um, but um, in words, we use it the opposite way. So this has some interesting consequences. So there's two problems from your textbook that are kind of interesting um, that I'd like you to think about, um, that what happens now if we have, say, a sailboat that's you know going really, really fast is velocity v, and it has a mass that has an angle. And so, as we said, the y direction shouldn't change at all, but the x direction does. And so that means that, that you think about the tan of the angle, and so the sine of this angle doesn't change, but the cosine of the angle does. Um, and so it's interesting to think about this. Um, and so I'll let you work that out. Um, another th interesting problem to think about is what happens when you have a circle um, and this some disk um, and this disk is spinning at some really, really fast speed. So as I said, the circumference is presumably Lorentz contracted. So although this thing is actually going around a circle and you recognize that you have to have centripetal acceleration, he says, okay, well, this, the outside edge of this has you know, some omega times r tangential velocity. If it has some tangential velocity, that means that this has to be length, length contracted. It's like, but that doesn't make any sense because this is a, a circle. Um, and so does that mean that you know the circumference uh, divided by r is now not related to to pi or two pi? Um, is it um, is it is it something is something else going on? Um, and so it's it's kind of a a tricky thing to think about. But basically, um, you have to recognize that you have to think about what this what this moving around in a circle really means. Um, because now you have to think about how uh, you have the centripetal acceleration that's keeping this whole thing together. Um, and basically, if you've ever watched like something, a video like the slow-mo guys, where they take like a record player and they speed it up to, I don't know, like, like 20,000 RPMs or something like that, you'll see that this record just shatters into a, a whole bunch of pieces. Um, and <laughs> what you'll realize is that this is... Um, kind of more of an academic exercise than something experimentally that you can really check because if you take any kind of piece of uh, any object and you spin it fast enough, this thing's just going to shred apart anyways. Um, but it's interesting to kind of think about. Okay, so we've kind of uh, been discussing these, uh, where we, we get these Lorentz uh, transformations. Um, and so I just want to relate them back to uh, Galilean transformations. So this is, as I said, Galileo knew these uh, from, you know, 400 years ago or so, around 1600, that if you have some object that's at point E here, and, you know, you have one object, uh, you have some frame that's moving relative to that frame, that nothing changes in X, Y, and time, of course, is going to be the same in this Galilean transformation. But this point E, so that's going to be given by this distance X here, will be changing by an amount VT when we go from X to X bar. And so that means that x bar is going to be x minus vt. That's simple enough. So we know that this works when we're going at very slow speeds. So when v is much less than the speed of light. 
Um, and so basically using Lorentz transformations, we recognize we should recover those things, but there's going to be some correction factor. And so since we had x bar is equal to gamma x, we now have x bar is equal to gamma x minus vt. Um, so that's easy enough for how that Lorentz transformation works for x. y bar is still y, z bar is still z, that doesn't change at all. Uh, but then time ends up changing in kind of a weird way. Um, so this time in this moving frame is going to be gamma times time as well. Uh, but there's this extra factor here that it's you also have to subtract off the velocity over c squared times x. Um, and that gives you the full time transformation. So these are the Lorentz transformations, um, and they reduce for very small velocities uh, to the Galilean transformations. Um, there's something that you've probably seen in uh, maybe EM fields or photons, or maybe even in high school when, when you were taught special relativity, um, and that's the velocity addition rule. Uh, this is much more of a mechanics problem than a um, electromagnetic waves problem. Uh, so I'm just kind of mentioning it here. Um, but now that we have uh, the Lorentz transformations, if we have some frame moving relative to us at a velocity v, um, then this object is moving in this frame with a velocity u, which is given by dx by dt. But of course, in this moving frame, um, it's not going to be moving as dx by dt, it's going to be moving dx bar by dt bar. So we have to look at what dx bar and dt bar are. Um, and so we just take the derivative, the full derivative of these, um, and so we'd get dx bar is equal to gamma x dx minus v dt, and we get dt bar is going to be gamma dt minus v over c dx. So these are the full derivatives, um, of our x and our t, and so that means that this velocity in this moving frame is going to be dx bar divided by dt bar, and so you just put in what those definitions are, what we've defined those to be, um, and you get that the, the velocity addition rule, you get dx by dt, but we said that dx by dt is this velocity in the stationary frame, um, minus v over 1 minus v over c squared, and then again dx by dt which is again u, and so the velocity addition rule is u minus v over 1 minus u times v over c squared. Um, and so that's, uh, that's one way to derive it, but you can also look at uh, what happens if you say we're like, um, you know, playing like cops and robbers, and you had this car that was speeding away from you, and you're in a cop car, and you're trying to say shoot that, uh, that car or something like that. Um, you know, if you're going at half the speed of light and then you shoot a bullet that's going half the speed of light, um, by Galilean addition rules, you would say, oh, that bullet comes out at the speed of light. Um, but by Einstein addition rule, um, it's actually going to be that we'd get this, you know, half the speed of light plus half the speed of light uh, divided by one plus, um, and this would be 0.25. And so this would always stay below uh, one. And in fact, you can check that by putting all these to C and then you get that uh, your answer is still, that the velocity is still c. So nothing can ever go faster than the speed of light uh, through this Einstein velocity addition rule. Okay, so that uh, concludes our um, discussion on uh, Lorentz transformations, and I'll be starting the next lecture. We'll be uh, giving some examples of um, the consequences of